what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Wise here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, um, like the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. He talked about how he made money as a street mime. Okay, that's how he'd make money, his food and rent money. He put a hat on the street, do street miming, and that's how he made money before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of the P90X uh, program. Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talks about growing her company to $20 million with five employees selling it to Disney. <laughs> but Ed, you'd appreciate this. You know, the most important, and um, I thought most impactful was she did this and she beat cancer twice um, while starting and running these companies. Um, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about when Steve, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no, imagine that, and many more. So check out inspiredinsider.com. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And for me, you know, ad podcasting is much more personal. I mean, obviously, it's the best thing I've done for my business and my life had, you know, amazing relationships, referral partners, strategic partners, but it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they're only members of their family to survive. And his legacy lives on because the Holocaust foundation did an interview with him and uh, to tell a story and he's not alive anymore, but I could still watch that interview and I put it on my about page actually on Fired Insider to motivate me and to, it just helps them leave a legacy. So yes, podcasting helps your business, but it really helps you and your guests leave a legacy beyond um, what we can do. And so our you know, brain power doesn't vanish into the ether. So if you have questions about it, you can go to rise25.com or email us support at rise25media. Dot com And I believe any business should have a podcast, period. And I know Ed has a podcast. You'll check it out too. Um, and Ed, let me, let me just introduce Ed for a second before we chat because it's just a jack of all, you know, really a master, not jack of all crazy, a master of many trades. Um, Ed Clay is a former professional mixed martial arts fighter turned fighter of end stage cancer. Um, through the Chipsa Hospital he started in Mexico and the United Cancer Centers, um, which are in the U.S. And at one point, he was ranked as high as number nine in the world, ran one of the largest mixed martial arts schools in the United States. Um, and he would say, you know, I've heard him say he's a better coach than an actual fighter, but um, so I can't imagine how good a coach you are uh, based on that. Um, but you know, some of his students have been in the you know Ultimate Fighting Championships. His clothing brand Gameness was acquired in 2011 and was one of the largest suppliers of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu martial arts uniforms in the world. And in 2015, he partnered up with Scott Nelson and Dedrick Perry, and they acquired Chips a Hospital in Tijuana, Mexico. And they took cancer management head on. They brought conventional and alternative sides of medicine. I know people drive and fly from all over the U.S. and even world to go to their center because of the combinations of conventional alternative they bring together to attack cancer from all angles. And Ed also started United Cancer Centers, which help the sickest cancer patients around the United States and has put together a team of some of the most experienced doctors, scientists, and researchers. If you go to unitedcancercenters.com and check out the team, it's just, I don't even know how he got these people to say yes. And he's going to tell, tell me how. But uh, Ed, thanks for having me. And thanks for having, okay. yeah, for, for being with me. Thanks for uh, having me on, Jeremy. Thank you. So I want you to tell the story about your mom because it's really influential. But I, I want to hold off on that for one second because I was saying, and we've talked about this before we hit record, about United Cancer Centers. When you describe your team, it's like the all-star team. Uh, so talk about the team and how do you attract that type of talent? Yeah, I, I think that it's a, uh, you attract people that share your vision. So 
um, we are very vision driven and mission driven. And we believe in this idea that people can get along and that different uh, people with a little different uh, difference in opinion uh, can come together if you have a st the, the same goal. And so um, we're just really blessed and fortunate to have guys like Dr. Franco Marancola, who was the former chief of immunogenetics for the National Institute of Health. He actually wrote one of the main textbooks that oncologists use for immunotherapy for cancer. Uh, guys like Dr. Michael Liebman, who uh, sits on 14 scientific advisory boards, professor at three medical schools, including one in China, uh, is actually head of the translational medicine, medicine department of the Pharma Foundation, which is big pharma. Uh, lots of guys like that. Uh, our whole team is stacked in a weighing. Dr. Vijay Mahant, just postdoc MD Anderson, a leader in liquid biopsy, um, things like that. So we really like share a vision and come together and realize that we have a lot more in common than uh, against each other per se. Actually, we have a lot in common. We get along great and um, we charge forward uh, doing our best to help cancer patients and trying to fix the system uh, that is set up in the United States where it's kind of an older system. The FDA has done a lot really in the last 10 years to make gains in clinical trials. Uh, but, you know, the system was built in like 1963 when the FDA was formed. And so uh, it's still a little slow compared to what we, we would like. Yeah. I mean, I think this applies whether you're in healthcare or business or whatever, attracting uh, the best team is paramount. And so how, talk about how hard was it to get these people on board with your mission and how does that conversation go? Sure. So, uh, you know, when we first started uh, Chipsa, you know, Chipsa was doing a lot of natural therapies and we were completely open-minded and uh, we saw some people getting better with end stage stage four cancer that had, had failed standard of care, but a lot of people were still dying. Um, we actually, you know, and we're like, look, this isn't, uh, this isn't okay. How do we, uh, build a bridge with the conventional community because quite frankly stage four cancer the conventional community doesn't have a very good uh, answer for it the alternative community doesn't have a really good answer for it and it's like why are we throwing stones at each other why does the alternative side throw giant stones the conventional side the conventional side throw giant stones the alternative side uh, while there's no really good answer and so uh, <clears throat> we actually started working with a company called Batu Biologics um, they did a trial at our hospital treated about 250 patients the trial cost them probably $750,000 we did it at cost. It would have cost them, uh, you know, up to 25 million in the United wow. States. And they actually yes. had two Nobel Prize winners on their, uh, on different boards. One of them, or actually one Nobel Prize winner on their board. Uh, and they also had Dr. Franco Marincola, uh, who is now our chief medical officer for United Cancer Centers. And uh, just started becoming friends with a lot of the people on their team, another company called Immunicom, their team, uh, IC MedTech, their team. And uh, Franco, Dr. Marincola was the, president, past president of the Society of Immunotherapy for Cancer, uh, which is probably the largest uh, uh, nonprofit for immunotherapy for cancer. And uh, this last year, you know, five to 10,000 people at their, at their convention. Um, and, you know, he really kind of opened up, a net, uh, opened up his network. And they're working on a lot of the things uh, that we're doing at CHIPSA, um, intermittent fasting um, uh, before chemotherapy. Uh, turning a tumor from cold to hot, all these concepts that we really believe in, focusing on different types of diet for cancer, not necessarily as a treatment, but as a good adjunct diet. Um, and you know, we were actually studying those things and doing those things, a lot of those things as well. Um, and they were doing it, but taking a much more scientific approach. And they have a lot of data coming out. So we just started uh, working together. We became good friends. And um, he, he shares a vision. He's also the founder and editor in chief of the Journal of Translational Medicine. And translational medicine isn't uh, really done that much in the United States, but uh, not, not, not done anymore, but it was before 1960, uh, 1962. It's from bench to bedside. How can a clinician also be a scientist? And a lot of people don't make that distinction, but clinicians aren't scientists in general. And so the, the bench to bedside, how do you see something with a patient and make an adjustment that can make a difference and then figure out how to, how to make that work scientifically as well. So that's really what he's passionate about. And that in a lot of ways is what United Cancer Centers uh, will be doing as well. Bench to bedside, how we get that translational medicine, you know, back in medicine today. We'll talk about, um, I'll have you talk about some of the, the patients and some of the cancers and then some of the types of treatments, alternative and then conventional. But why that huge disparity of 25 million 
in the US versus 750,000 for for you to help them get it done? It's just it's expensive to run clinical trials in the United States. I mean you you pay uh you, know, you have to have all the doctors and all the scientists and all the insurance and all the regulations that go into doing that in the United States. And it's not that much. Uh, it doesn't cost near that much in Mexico if you really do it at cost and, and you're not looking to, to make a profit off of it. Uh, and you're, you're trying to do it at the, at the lowest cost possible to give them the best uh, possible data that, that you can. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really just that. So some things, you know, Ed, have changed in the law that, you know, I want you to talk about the United Cancer Centers and kind of what you'll be using as far as there's some changes with the trial, laws of the trial, right? So talk a little bit about what's going on and then what is United Cancer Center is going to do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the right to try legislation passed in June of 2018. Uh, it was already uh, passed in 42 states, I believe it was at the state level, but this was the federal le legislation. It was bipartisan legislation. Um, and it says that any drug that's been through a phase one trial, uh, phase one FDA trial, uh, the patient can ask that specific pharmaceutical company for the drug and the pharmaceutical company can give them that drug uh, without bad repercussions like the data being used against them in future clinical trials or being sued. Um, so that, uh, that was a big change in the law that really allowed patients access. Now the pharmaceutical company can say no to the patient, and what United Cancer Centers is, we're the first institution to implement the right to try legislation. So we'll go and uh, make deals with the pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies so we have access to these drugs so patients can get them fast. And then we'll be actually hitting more data points than in a, a normal FDA trial. So we'll be collecting more data for the pharmaceutical companies so they have a good idea how their, their product is going to perform in future clinical trials. Uh, we'll also be using <clears throat> like a hypothesis that we create uh, based off of all of our scientists and what they really want to want to learn as far as immune responsiveness and and how uh, the tumor mi microenvironment works and how you turn tumors from cold to hot and get the immunotherapies to work better. So we'll be looking at things like low dose chemotherapy, fractionated radiation, uh, different ways of doing conventional methods that in many ways cause less side effects but could make the immunotherapy drugs, the new conventional immunotherapy drugs work better so um things like intermittent fasting too like little, little little adjustments and then using those data points and allowing the biotechs and pharmaceutical companies that are working with us with their drugs to uh look at them differently in combination so it's really kind of opening up the uh possibility for pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to get great data on their drugs at not an extra cost I mean, it's not going to cost them $25 million to get that anymore. The patient pays uh, just the cost of the medication. So at least the, the pharmaceutical company's cost is taken care of the medication. And then it's a win-win across the board because they're not paying an exorbitant am amount of money for this drug. And the pharmaceutical company also gets amazing data too. And most importantly, uh, it benefits the patient when the drug works. And we have a good idea based off genetic information uh, what drugs uh, could work and, and might not work. And we'll be picking those drugs from the pharmaceutical companies based off the pa patient's genetic profile. Hmm. And it seems like you're creating just a, almost like a, even a bigger vision beyond that with the database you're forming that's going to help cancers overall. What's your vision, ultimate vision with that? Yeah, so, um, well, a couple of things. I mean, the data is very, very important. And uh, sometimes people will debate like, oh, y'all aren't collecting the data with this right to try thing. But like, no, no, wait a second. You can't say that. We're collecting way more data. We're going to have, we're, we're going to be collecting more data than anyone, I believe. Uh, so that, at least that's the goal. Uh, we also have, uh, we're also going to be working with IBM Watson uh, using their supercomputer to um, uh, aggregate data for us and actually give patients an idea of what drugs are available in different countries. So if hmm. we don't have something available here, oh, you can go to China for this. Oh, you can go here for this. We want them to, to stay here and to uh, use our, our you know, use drugs that we have access to. But if we don't hmm. have access to something, we want the best for the patient. So hmm. Then we'll say, hey, it's here in Germany. You're welcome to call them. Here's the number, yeah. et cetera. So we really want to give the patients access and transform, um, transform, the whole process for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's game changing because, I mean, that's, you have the unique perspective because of Chipsa, you know, and be able to do certain things that maybe people wouldn't be able to do in the U.S. And, well, why make it only Mexico, right? Because someone may in China have some kind of mushroom that would help someone. So that kind of leads me to, you know, I know in your public about this, so I'll ask it right out. At one point, you will get into your, your martial arts career, but you had so much pain and you were addicted to, to pill, pain pills because you just need to get through. And, and I, this kind of relates, right? Um, that journey of that addiction. So I want, you know, talk a little bit about that. Sure. And around 2007, I tore my LCL, PCL meniscus. Uh, we had team doctors at our, at our uh, MMA gym. <clears throat> They'd give me prescription pain pills and I was taking them for about two years. And I went to stop one day and went through a, a withdrawal and took another pill. Of course, the withdrawal ends. And I tried that over a six month period, you know, four or five times, went through that process, well, was unsuccessful getting off of them. And so I went to a therapist and I told the therapist, you know, I'm completely functional running uh, my companies, but you know, I'd rather have a clear brain and deal with the pain than a foggy brain and no pain whatsoever. And the therapist told me America's behind the times when it comes to opiate withdrawal, uh, you need to Google Ibogaine. And so I Google Ibogaine and uh, it comes from Africa. It's illegal in the United States. Supposedly it stopped 100% of opiate withdrawals. I didn't really believe it. Uh, but then I watched a couple of documentaries like, yeah, you know what? I'll give it a try, you know? And uh, so I took a plane to Mexico City and took a bus a couple hours south that I began in somebody's bedroom, was home <laughs> 72 hours later, uh, never had a withdrawal, never had a craving, never had another opiate uh, since. And so then I asked myself, if that's not available in the United States but can help people, what else is out there? And then that sent me down the rabbit hole to where we are today. I don't know if it's too personal, but what happened in that bedroom? Like, what, what, is, how do, what do they do? <laughs> Well, ibogaine is, you know, probably the strongest psychedelic drug in the world. So it's uh, deeply introspective. It's what the Bwiti use for the rites of passage ceremony. Ceremony. So um, I dealt with a lot of things, maybe that I was uh, uh, afraid of or uh, was was faced with, and some different perspective. And it just uh, gave me a lot of insight for even more love and compassion for my family. I think one of my greatest fears was my mom, who was sick, dying without the uh, without knowing how much I loved her. That really scared me. My, both my parents, like, you know, we see with Kobe Bryant, with what, what just happened to Kobe Bryant, you know, it's like stunning for the country. It's like so quick. You know, are you telling your mom you love her? Are you telling your dad you love him? You know, your family, your friends, are you doing that? Because you might not get a chance tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And that is what, uh, you know, I, I think that's what's really important. That's actually uh, one of the main things I, I got from that. Like, go tell your, your friends and family, especially your mom yeah. and dad, that you love them because you're not going to be around forever. You know, Ed, you had an amazing interview, and I, I encourage people to check it out with you, um, Scott, and Eddie Bravo. And um, <clears throat> tell people first where they can find that, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what I was going to ask you. Yeah, thebigideapodcast.com. Okay. Yeah, check it out. It's two hours and 15 minutes worth every minute. Um, but, you know, Eddie talks about how in that, that um, his dad never told him he loved him. And so then he, basically was talking about how he oh you know i don't know he it was his son or one of his children he basically tells him like every second he's like yeah 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 dad i know and it's kind of exactly what you were talking about yeah i mean eddie was saying that his dad didn't really tell me he loved him a lot and so he's telling his son all the time you know i love he's like dad you know i, I you said it like 20 times a day you know but that's important. That's important. We, we, we don't, we may not realize every day because we take a lot for granted. I think that we all take certain things for granted. And, um, you know, it, it takes something like what happened with Kobe or a close friend or loved one to realize, Hey, we need to value every single day and, you know, really tell those people that we love them. One of the things that you talked a lot about <laughs> with the three of you in that conversation was mindset. And especially with the mixed martial arts background, mindset is key. And then you were joking around saying, you know, it's not emphasized enough as, as far as in cancer treatments, right? So talk about the importance of mindset and how you incorporate that into CHIPSA and into the treatment. Yeah, I always say, you know, mindset could be the most important thing. You know, I can't, I'm not saying that it is, but it could be, I, I don't know. It, it could be. And, you know, you look at 
you know, I, I, I relate everything or a lot of things to, to fighting, mixed martial arts fighting. It's combat. One person goes in the cage, two people go in the cage, one person's going to win. And I mean, it would be stupid if I were training a fighter to tell him, don't worry about your mindset. It doesn't matter. Don't focus. Don't get it in the zone. Don't visualize. Don't do those things that we can't exactly quantify scientifically and say this is getting the result, but, but we know that it is. You know, we know it. We know it makes a difference. And so for cancer patients, I think it's very underutilized. I don't think that it's, it's used enough, and it might be the most important thing, having a good mindset, being focused, knowing what you want, visualizing, manifesting those things to uh, become real, and not being attached to the, to the result. You know, not saying, oh, I had a very positive mindset. It didn't work this time. But no, you know what? That happens. That's all of us. Nobody's figured it all out, but we know that it's important to have a good mindset. So, um, you know, at Chipsa, we have a class called The Power of the Mind, uh, where we really, uh, it's, a, it's a, a group uh, class where they really dig into what's going on and really kind of bring it back to what's important, which is human connection. Mm. Um, we also... I have three psychologists full time that work with our patients. And so they can really kind of go in and a lot of people say that chips is kind of like the spiritual experience for them. Um, because we are, you know, we're hitting, uh, the, the mindset, you know, deeply and we're giving those patients uh, an opportunity to, to heal that because so if that healing, uh, supports them in their ultimate healing of their cancer, then, um, you know, it's, it's a giant win. How did you prepare while you were fighting? Like before um, a fight or training, how did you prepare as far as focus and getting in the state and everything like that? Well, I mean, so, so I, I, you know, I was ranked uh, number nine in the world at one point by the shooter organization, but I like to say that was only after three professional fights and they really wanted to get me in, into their organization. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was very good in the gym at the time and young and one of the first really MMA guys that was training, you know, high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, high level boxing you know, professional level boxing, professional level Muay Thai kickboxing, and I was one match to All-American Wrestling. So the combination then was great now. You know, it's a little, everybody's like that, you know. But, um, you know, the mind, I say that because the mindset uh, for me going into fight and what I would train my fighters was, you know, every time they would do a push-up, and I got this from Lloyd Irvin, they would say, I am a champion. I am a champion. I am a mm. champion. Those I am statements are super important. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, any type of training, I, I love those I am statements. Uh, at the end of a training session, walking them through a, a, you know, a five to 15 minute guided meditation where they see themselves in the ring. They go through their perfect game plan. And at the end of the fight, they see their hand being raised. Uh, when they stand up every time, raising their hands. Mm. So it's a lot of those things that are kind of subliminal that, uh, you know, it's just, you, you, you go into them over and over. It becomes a practice. I am a champion. You know, I am a champion. I'm, I'm okay. I, I've got this. I've got this. Focus. You know, so really focusing on where they want to go in the fight and using affirmations to, to support um, the result. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's super <laughs> powerful. Anyone could use that. Um, your mom, <clears throat> one of the inspirations behind this is your mom. What happened with her? Yeah, so um, you know, after the, the whole Ibogaine uh, story, I was, I was looking for, uh, I was like, what else is out there that's not available in the United States that can help people? My mom <clears throat> had a very, aggressive version of rheumatoid arthritis and she had failed the standard medications she had broke her back on a shortfall um, from the prednisone she had uh, gotten tuberculosis from the side effects of another one of the medications and um, <clears throat> multiple staph infections so she couldn't take the immunosuppressants they're suppressing their immune system she has an overactive immune system with an autoimmune disease it was suppressing her immune system so uh, she couldn't handle those medications. And so I was looking for answers for her, and I came across a paper on Coley's toxins for rheumatoid arthritis that was written in 1923. And to me, not being a scientist, uh, it just made common sense. Like, <clears throat> instead of suppressing the immune system, it hyper, like, stimulated the immune system. And so it reset it from the other way. So Coley's would go in, and it activates the innate immune system. There's a lot of things uh, to the body and it causes acute inflammation. Like when she did the coles, her joints really swelled up. Um, and then the next day it was down tremendously mm. and it made, it was like, okay, our hypothesis made sense. Now that's just one anecdotal patient. This has not been scientifically proven, but it did like, okay, you're on the right path. 
uh, and actually it deserves more study. But um, yeah, so for her, uh, she was our, our second patient. We actually bought the hospital that had the uh, Coley's toxins. So this hospital was the only hospital in North America that had it had been closed for about two years. And um, she came How in. How do you discover the hospital? <clears throat> oh my gosh, it was luck. You know, so we were very familiar with uh, a lot of the alternative treatments. We were familiar with Coley's toxins. We were familiar with Gerson therapy. And we actually drove by it with a guy who we were looking at an Ibogaine facility with and saying, oh yeah, our five to seven year plan is cancer, but this is where we're starting. And he's like, let me take you by this hospital that nobody's at anymore that closed down. And we took a picture of the hospital, called a real estate agent uh, while we were back in Nashville, called a real estate agent in Tijuana and said, hey, here's a picture of this hospital. Do you know what it is? He said, do you know the owner? And he's like, uh, yeah. He said, well, that was the original Gerson hospital. I'm like, hmm. what? And I'm like, was that the hospital of Coley's Hopkins? Could that be it? Sure enough, uh, we met the, met the owner. And um, it had closed two years later. He was kind of retiring. <clears throat> He's almost 70 years old. And so we purchased it from him. Um, and uh, yeah, our mom, or my mom was our, one of our, uh, was our second patient. And she came in in a wheelchair. Actually, the arthritis was attacking her organs. She had it covered from head to toe uh, in a rash. And she wow. left three weeks later walking. And the rash went away about six weeks later. So, uh, so what did you do her? with her? Actually, Back up a second. So it's like, yeah, we bought the hospital. My mom, I want to stick on the bought the hospital thing. Like what, how does, what is the discussion with you and Scott and Dedrick around, Hey, I got this, you know, like people have hard enough time. Like, Hey, where do you want to go eat for dinner? Like, Hey, I just passed this hospital. Let's buy it. What is, how, what did that conversation look like with the three of you? Well, I mean, <clears throat> We had been looking to figure out the licensing issues in Mexico for a long time. <clears throat> so um, this hospital, uh, you know, had a license and I was like, hey, so, you know, instead of having to go through the whole licensing process, uh, this one already has a pathway to it. It's already, uh, you know, got COVA priest approval or has in the past and we just get to, uh, you know, get the licensing again. But um, yeah, it was, you know, Scotty actually was initially involved in the pro project and I had um, spent a lot of cash over the years uh, working on this and he came in and, and helped out really uh, with the rest. Um, so Scotty was just on board to, to make a difference and to help my mom. I mean, he's obviously very successful uh, you know, in his other businesses as well. And, um, but he was just on board, you know, for the mission to make mm -hmm. a difference. You know, he's almost 50 years old now and he's like, man, I got to make a big difference uh, outside of mixed martial arts in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what Scotty is about. For those that know Scotty, I mean, Scotty has more friends just about anybody I know. Like he's, if you look at his life, he, he has had a life of service in mixed martial arts. I mean, he's mm -hmm. one of the first people to sponsor a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and mixed martial arts fighters. People were always sleeping on his couch. Yeah, he was one of the first Americans to go to Brazil. Everybody, all the Americans that went to Brazil would stay with Scotty. He just helped, helped, helped. What do you need? Here's some shirts. Here's some gear. Here's some. So that's that's what his life was even before that. And you know, this was an opportunity to give back on a bigger picture thing that makes mm. a bigger, you know difference in in society and with humanity. How did you meet Scott? <clears throat> Gosh, I met Scotty when I was 15 years old at a mm. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournament. Uh, I think it was like the Joe Marrero tournament in California. We, I didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my, my mom worked for American Airlines, and so I flew for free. And so I would fly out to the tournaments, and Scotty was uh, always there. <laughs> so that's, I met him 23, almost 24 years ago. And did, was there any relationship beyond that with training or, or anything like that? How did it progress throughout the years when you were oh, 15? Gosh, we've been best friends for yeah that, that long. And uh, we trained together. Uh, you know, Scotty had OTN, which is on the mat. <clears throat> he also had a competitor of my company, uh, Lucky Geese. We, you know, we, we joke because people are like, hi, oh, all are competitors. Yes, but we shared everything. We shared the same manufacturer. You know, anytime uh, Scotty needed help, I would help him. Anytime uh, he needed help or uh, I needed help, he would help me. I mean, it was always how do we help each other with two competing companies, you know, reach our goal. It's a lot easier to uh, get ahead by working with each other than against each other. And, uh, yeah, so we, we worked together for a very long time as competitors but as partners in a way. And then Dedrick, how do you know Dedrick? So I met Dedrick. He had 
just got out of the advertising industry, very successful uh, in the advertising industry in Chicago. And he wanted to see the impact that he could make on a smaller company. And so we interviewed him for Nashville Mixed Martial Arts. Actually, my brother interviewed him. He's like, hey, this guy's way overqualified. <laughs> I got to meet him. He kind of told me what he was going to do. I'm like, yeah, man, come on in. He ended up buying Nashville Mixed Martial Arts from me eventually. And, uh, but when this project was finally coming around, and it took a long time. I mean, we, we did chips uh, fast, but we were working on figuring out the licensing issues for, let's see, probably five years before that. Wow. So we've been working on it for five years before we even opened Chipsa. Mm. And, um, so when that happened, Dedrick uh, sold Nashville Mixed Martial Arts and came uh, and moved to Tijuana as well. All three of us moved to Tijuana, Mexico. So back to your mom for a second. She, and if anyone's experienced family or friend with rheumatoid arthritis, it like basically eats away your joints. I mean, it's eating your own body, your autoimmune disease. So she was in a wheelchair, then she's walking and doing a million times better. What were some of the things that you did with her to help? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing is diet. Um, she did a very strict Gerson therapy, which is 13 fresh pressed organic juices a day, uh, five coffee enemas a day. Um, it's uh, all, you know, 15 to 20 pounds of fresh pressed organic juices a day. It's wow. a lot. You're pumping a lot in. And then the coffee enemas, um, the, the idea is that it opens up the bile ducts in your liver, pumps out the toxins through your gallbladder and out your stomach. Um, so your, your blood pumps to your liver once. Uh, every three or so minutes at a 15 minute coffee enema, you'd be looking at 15 or five times. So uh, constantly putting in uh, all of those phytochemicals and all of that goodness from uh, the organic juices, the pressed organic juices, and then dumping out the toxins. Uh, so that, that was number one. <clears throat> number two is, um, was the coles as well, the coles toxins. You know, coles toxins, it's an amazing, uh, I say drug amazing treatment that was actually uh it was discovered in 1891 or it was made in 1890 do you know the history of coley's toxins no i don't you know, oh no. my god so dr william coley is considered the father of immunotherapy um he was working at memorial hospital which is now sloan kettering um he uh very he famous surgeon yeah. he had a patient named betsy dashell who had a sarcoma and he amputated her arm thinking that was going to stop the spread of the cancer. It didn't. She died a few weeks later and it really upset him. So Dr. Coley uh, went through the files in Memorial Hospital to see if anybody had survived a sarcoma. Nobody had survived a sarcoma except one patient. He found this patient. It was like seven years later, brought him back in. And it turned out while the patient was, uh, uh, ha had the sarcoma, he also got an erysipelas infection. Hmm. And when he almost died of that infection, but when he survived the infection, the cancer was gone. So Dr. Coley thought, well, if an accidental infection can cause a spontaneous remission, then an intentional infection should also cause uh, a spontaneous remission. <clears throat> so he, infect he infected multiple patients with uh, the live bacteria. Some went into complete remission. Others actually died from the infection. So then Dr. Coley changed it from a live bacteria to a dead bacteria, two types of dead bacteria. And from 1891 to 1936, Dr. Coley had a higher success rate treating most cancers than we do today. Hmm. Uh, his daughter found the Cancer Research Institute in like 1952. Um, a lot of the immunotherapy drugs that we're seeing today, the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, uh, the scientists from the Cancer Research Institute actually worked on those. Dr. He uh, Helen Coley Knotts, which is Dr. Coley's daughter, she actually mentored a doctor named Lloyd Old, who was the vice president of Sloan Kettering. Uh, because of Dr. Old, I think he's a, a big reason we also have immunotherapy for cancer today. And, um, you know, in the textbooks, it, Coley's toxins was made illegal in the United States in 1965. Why? Uh, even though doctors were saying, no, actually, this stuff did work. Um, and now today, um, Dr. Coley in the textbooks is still considered the father of immunotherapy. And it's not a question of if his treatment worked. It absolutely worked. Um, but there's other reasons really today that it's not, not available. Why was it illegal? Why was it deemed illegal? Well, you know, back then, so you figure mustard gas was uh, a, like made available in 1948. They were using it for blood cancers. And they thought for some reason that if, well, if we use this toxin, if this, this chemotherapy, 
uh, in a uh, solid tumor, it's going to work the same as a blood tumor. And they did that for like, I don't know, 70 plus years, it seems like. Um, but it didn't work. And I think that they were so focused on those drugs and Coley's didn't really fall into that. They didn't understand how it worked. They didn't really believe the immune system played a role. And uh, so they came up with a lot of reasons to not do it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Coley's stocks is now, there's a drug called CPG. Uh, Pfizer has a patent for CPG. They have multiple clinical trials. A couple others have a, a variation of CPG. CPG is just one of the danger signals in Coley's toxins. Coley's toxins is really hard to patent. You could patent it, but you could also make a small adjustment. And so if a pharmaceutical company is going to put a billion dollars into a clinical trial with, say, Coley's toxins, uh, you know, if somebody can come in and change the patent a little bit and, and make a similar drug, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them uh, from a commercial standpoint. So nobody's, you know, going to do that. But in my opinion, Coley's toxins is the best adjuvant out there. Uh, and I think historically it has been too. And I think historically, if you look at the numbers, it has higher success than most of the things that we're doing today. So I wanted to walk through a few <clears throat> patients, um, for, you know, that you've seen through CHIPSA and the to give people an example of the combination of the conventional and alternative with some of them. And, um, what are some of the most common, I mean, cause they come to you in what state typically they're in stage <clears throat> three, four, what, yeah, sorry. Most of the patients have failed uh, standard of care uh, or stage four and have failed standard of care. So they've already gone through the best of conventional therapy uh, and, and that has failed or uh, they're stage four and they were given, you know, six months to live, three months to live. Uh, so a lot, basically what the right to try law uh, in the United States is now set up for. <clears throat> um, how do people find you? Uh, mostly the internet, um, or word of mouth. So, um, hmm. you know, internet or word of mouth, uh, one or of, this show, what's this that? show could save someone's life. I mean, who knows, you know, what I mean? oh, they hear, they've but never heard, that. never heard of the facility before. Yeah, absolutely. With, with Chips a Hospital, I mean, it's, it's a, it makes a big difference. I mean, we don't have all the answers. Anybody who says, says they have a cure is, is lying. Anybody, I, I always look at where people say, oh, I know what's going on. Like, you don't know what's going on because the people that are studying this the most don't know what's going on. In reality, nobody really knows. It's not an easy answer. This stuff's super complicated. You could have two patients, I always say this, you could have two patients with the same cancer treated with the same treatments. One patient responds, one patient doesn't. Why is that? You know, it's very, very complicated, but uh, we do have some cool options in Mexico that, you know, I've seen, um, you know, stage four cancer uh, go away. You know, the, the trick is to it staying away, but I've also seen old school patients, 15, 20, 25, 40 years out that are still alive to this day. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's really promising. Walk me through a memorable case so people get a sense of, the the mixture of conventional and alternative what what patients stick out for you that have come through the clinic um let's see gosh uh, well, well that really combines we got getting ryan lelf uh stage four b cell follicular lymphoma um conventional therapy has a pretty good response to lymphoma um although it's not a curative response but uh um we've done a nice little combination with him uh, Laura Payne. Uh, Laura came to us in hospice. She actually drove from Knoxville, Tennessee, all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, because she couldn't fly and there was pressure on her brain. And she was blind in her left eye when she came. And within uh, two weeks, she could, she got vision back. We got a, it was a giant tumor coming out of her head. Uh, we got about an 80% reduction. Mm -hmm. Now it's three years later. She's having a rough time right now battling back, but that's a good example of, uh, someone who we drastically extended their life without toxic side effects. Uh, you know, it's three years ago from hospice to where she is. Uh, what, what kind of treatments do you do with her? What would be? Um, it would be a combination like lower dose chemotherapy, um, like a 15 to 20% dose. I believe she was doing um, different immunotherapies. Um, we've got, uh, of course, diet, we believe is really important as well. Um, something called, uh, VG5000, which is a placental-based uh, vaccine um, that 
uh, cuts off the blood supply, kind of like an Avastin, but a, a, a little different. Um, and uh, gosh, I think she's done dendritic cell vaccines. I mean, we do dendritic cell vaccines at Chipsa. You know, Provenge is the only dendritic cell that's approved in the United States uh, through the FDA for prostate cancer. Three doses is $93,000. We, we can do those three doses for about 12500 to put it in perspective, but same type of thing. So Laura's done that. Uh, lymphokine activated killer cells. Uh, in the 1980s, they did a lot of studies on that. They haven't done a lot of studies, though. Uh, the National Cancer Institute did studies on that. They haven't done studies, though, in combination therapy. We use it in combination. Don't look at it as standalone therapy. A lot of stuff that we're doing, some has been studied, but it's studied as standalone therapies. And a lot of these treatments really aren't designed for standalone. You need combination. You need to hit it from different different uh, ways to uh, work on the biology of, of cancer. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's really aggressive forms and then not as aggressive. Um, the question, you know, for let's say someone is first diagnosed with the prostate cancer that's not progressed, um, would, let's say it's one of your family members, would you still recommend them coming into the, coming to CHIPSA for certain treatments? Um, or would you have them you know, do the conventional first? Yeah, so I guess it, it all depends. Like one, I, I, they have to talk to a doctor because I'm not a doctor, so I, I, I wouldn't exactly be the one to recommend it, but like thought process behind it, you know, uh, stage one prostate cancer that hasn't uh, metastasized or traveled. I mean, uh, I believe that surgery um, has a pretty good prognosis. Of course, a lot of men don't want to have that surgery, so if that's the case, and, and they would have other options. There's reasonably good uh, options in the United States for prostate cancer, especially before it's spread. Um, and I think that for most people, that is the best, uh, the best choice where you, you, know, you cut it out or uh, I, I forget the, the different drugs that they get you on, the, the hormonal drugs. But mm -hmm. um, I think lupine, uh, I, I forget the, the, the medications, but um, it's reasonably good. Uh, prognosis with prostate cancer. And a lot of it depends as well on what the Gleason score is, how aggressive it is. Um, some of it's so slow that, you know, oncologists will tell them not to worry about it. And I would uh, suggest, you know, I would think that that makes sense. I'll tell you one interesting thing with prostate cancer though, <clears throat> is there's uh, something called, uh, something called apatone, which is uh, vitamin C and K3 at 101 ratio. We actually got apatone approved in Mexico about three years ago, but uh, Apatone has a phase one FDA trial for prostate cancer, uh, and it actually shows that it almost flatlined the elevation of uh, the rise of PSAs. Hmm. So that is something that if it were me that had a family member, if I had prostate cancer, probably the first thing I do would be to start taking Apatone from what we've seen, relatively uh, hmm. low side effects, uh, and you know it just makes sense. But yeah, something like prostate cancer, I guess it, there's a lot of variables. It just depends on, like I said, Gleason score, if it's spread, those type of things. Yeah. I want to talk about how people can proactively help themselves. Like we're talking about, you know, once you get cancer, but I'm sure you've discovered a lot of things of, wow, like maybe we should start doing this before we get cancer. Imagine that. But before we talk about that, I want to ask about, you know, this is, it's a really your job is really tough in a lot of respects and especially in an emotional respect because these people, some of them die, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you personally deal with, and I don't know if you've seen the staff deal with that on a daily basis, even though you have a higher success rate than most, it's like people are coming with in dire straits, I imagine. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, when it's stage four sent home, you know, they're basically sent home to die with no great options. Um, you know, it's, you know, more people die than survive. You know, that's just a fact. And a lot of, of these clinics and stuff or hospitals don't like to admit that even conventional, but that's just the reality. We're dealing with stage four, you know, it, not just stage four patients, but you know, the, the toughest cases of stage four. So you have to really have a passion for helping people and, and loving people no matter what. I think that you, like for me, it's just realizing that every single person needs to be treated as an individual, not separate. And if I can make a connection with that and give them some hope, uh, I think I'm, I'm doing a good job. I think that we're doing a good job anytime that we can extend life, which I believe we do a lot. I think we do a lot more life extension than curing cancer. 
Uh, that's just a reality. I mean, that's a lot more life extension than even getting a full remission in cancer. Um, you know, but you know, what would you do? Like, how much is it worth for to have an extra three months, six months, year, two years, three years with your loved one? I mean, think about this, Jeremy. Uh, who's your closest loved one that, that has passed away? Passed away was. Um, I mean, I I had grandfathers and grandmother passed away. Okay, so your grandfather. What would you give for another month to yeah, just totally. talk to talk to them? Yeah, you know, it's like it's it's no, priceless. It's priceless, man. And that's the difference that I can confidently say that we make every day. We make that difference for most patients where I feel like we extend their life. And, you know, so that's, that's what we, and that fills me up to where it's not a loss every time someone passes away because we deal with a lot of death. And, you know, at, at first, it, you know, you're trying to solve this extremely complicated problem and coming from a fight background, it's like, if, if they're dying, we weren't, you know, winning, you know, and, um, but I, I don't believe that's really a logical case. Uh, that's an emotional case, but we have to, we have to think about this differently. And, and the main thing is we want to extend life. When we get the miracles, we celebrate them. When we extend life, we celebrate them. And ultimately, um, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of how I handle it because I, I know that we're, helping people overall. How do you, what parallels do you draw from, <clears throat> from fighting cancer to fighting in the octagon? Oh gosh, a lot. I mean, <clears throat> so I, I gave the analogy on that podcast about, um, you know, the parallels between mixed martial arts and uh, cancer. And so like in the very first UFCs, uh, you, you know, I always wanted to know what was the best style? Like who, like, what is it? Is it karate? Is it Taekwondo? Is it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? I didn't even know about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I, I wanted to know what was, what actually worked. You know, when I was a kid, uh, like my favorite time of the year was when the telephone book would come out because we didn't have money to, to uh, g give me martial arts lessons. Uh, but I wanted to know. So I'd call up all the instructors like, Hey, you know, you think your karate is better than this Taekwondo? Like, hey, this is doing this. like I just wanted Market to know. research. Right. I was doing my research. And so, um, when the UFC came out, it was like, oh my gosh, these questions are finally going to be answered. This is the, what I always wanted to know. And so this little Brazilian came in and won everything. Like, oh my gosh, it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That's where it's at. Like that is, that's what's, that's what it is. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the best martial arts. And then you started seeing the wrestlers learn how to defend the submissions from the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy. And then you had the kickboxers start to learn how to defend the takedown of the wrestler and the kickboxers started to win. And then it became this thing that's what we see as mixed martial arts today, but you couldn't really deny what worked and what didn't work. You know, the same, that's how we look at it. You can at, deny it because one person emerges the winner. Exactly. And with cancer, um, we took the same approach. Like we weren't looking at it like a conventional oncologist or scientist per se. You know, we knew the power of the mind going in. We knew the power of diet going in. We knew this is like, you, you can't argue, argue that with us. Like we know it. You're not going to convince me that the mind doesn't matter. You're not going to convince me that diet doesn't matter. Like, no, does it matter the same for everybody? No, but overall, if we have a system where we train people's mind and positive things and let them work on the issues that they've had and let them focus on getting well and let them let go of any of the baggage that they're holding on, they're probably going to get a better response. If they, uh, focus on a diet, no matter what it is. If it's not Gerson therapy, they're probably going to get a, a better response. That's from our MMA training. We understand that. <clears throat> so, but for the treatments, also, we couldn't deny that the alternative side and the conventional side don't have very good answers. Like the suggest, when I see some of these videos and the, 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 the claims that people are making, like, oh, this is the answer for this. Like, man, they don't know what they're talking about. Like, not, I, I think they might think that they know what they're talking about, but it's way more complicated than you know, not eating sugar or, you know, uh, turning the body alkaline or a lot of these things, things that. What are some of the misconceptions? Yeah. What are some of those misconceptions that you people hear that it, it obviously plays a, a role, but not as much as what some tout. What are, so like yeah. you just mentioned a few, what are some other misconceptions with the alternative side? 
I think a big misconception is that if it works for one person, it's going to work for everybody. Uh, do I believe that there's some strange results that are out there? Sure, but it's not, you're not going to do Rick Simpson oil with every person and get this result. Uh, have I seen Rick Simpson oil put on a tumor and the, the uh, like on the outside uh, of the skin and it go down or away? Yes, but how is that going to work if you have a tumor in your liver? How's that going to work if you have something like, how's, like, how's that going to work? Um, and I don't think anybody can really tell us that. You know, the, the idea that <clears throat> a lot of the cases that you hear, they were doing a lot of other things. So they might have been doing conventional therapy as well, but you're saying, oh no, it's this. It's gotta be this. Like, no, you don't know that. Just because you were eating apricot kernel, apricot kernels and uh, doesn't mean that it's apricot kernels that got rid of your cancer. It could have been the chemotherapy or it could have been the radiation or it could have been the surgery. I mean, there's some people out there that are like, that have surgery and then focus on their diet. And they're like, you know what? I don't know if I were to do it over again if I ordered in the surgery. I'm like, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. And you're suggesting to people that your cancer went away uh, by your diet when, you know, well, it's just as much of a possibility, if not way more, that the surgery actually did, uh, did more than the diet. You know, there's a lot of common sense than, than going the other way. The conventional uh, side would say, oh, well, the diet didn't matter at all. No, I think it actually probably mattered a lot if someone did surgery and then really focused on being healthy. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination of things. And, and I, I think that people get so stuck on being right and it being one way when it could be a combination of things. And we need to study those combinations, but we don't need to dismiss them so quickly to make ourselves right and be aligned with, mm -hmm. you know, one way of thinking. That's what's happened for so long. We throw mm -hmm. these, oh, this side doesn't know, this side doesn't know. Another thing is like, talking about a cure for cancer. What is a cure for cancer? I don't even know what it is. What is a cure for cancer? Um, because are you talking about the cure? Like what's the cure or what a cure? Because, you know, there's multiple definitions and I don't think anybody really knows. I hear, I hear people say, oh, this is the cure. The, eh, the cure? I mean, because- It's a bold it statement. A, yeah, what is a cure anyway? I don't even know what that is. So n nothing that I've ever seen works in every patient. And most of it doesn't work in most in reality. So, you know, I, that's, that's probably the biggest misconception. This isn't making anybody wrong. I'm saying be open-minded to right. all things and don't throw out other things uh, just because, you know, of, of your position. Yeah, I mean, you and Eddie and Scott were talking about ego and how – you can't survive in the MMA if you have a big ego because you need to, what? What were you, were you were? You lose every day. I mean, you go into the gym and, you know, we had above, when you walk into my gym, above the door, it would say, leave your ego at the door. Mm. Because, you know, you're, you're getting into that training room with real professionals that know what they're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's, you're going to get tapped out really quickly and it's no big deal. You just, you're just not on that level. But you know, if, when you go and train with the best, if you have an ego, you might get your arm broken. You know, you might get your, you might think that, Oh, I can go and load up my punches on this guy and uh, on this high level professional. And then you hit them hard once and you're, you're turning it up on them, trying to hurt them. They're going to knock you out real quick. So you got to leave your ego at the door because you know, I've seen a lot of really tough guys walk in there and they, they leave, you know, crying and upset. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's why I say leave your ego. That's why the ego is such a big thing in mixed martial arts. Same thing for cancer. Like, I mean, we just want to do what's best for the patient. There can't be an ego in it. You know, there can't be an ego in it. We just want to do what's best for the patient because if, if there's an ego in it, if we wanted to get rich, we're the original Gerson hospital. We could have just done Gerson therapy for the last five years and said, Oh no, it's all diet. Like, Come on, come on. I mean, has it worked for some? We've seen it work for some, but for the majority of people, no. It doesn't work like that. We had the original Gerson Hospital, so it's hard to, now, I love Gerson therapy. I you know my mom did Gerson therapy. I've done Gerson therapy. I believe in the power of Gerson therapy. So you have somebody who believes in it, but just not as a cancer treatment, not as the only way to do things. So I think it's just having that open mindset that, that uh, if people did that, I think even you know, most people have a better chance of surviving their cancer, being open-minded, not being closed-minded to, oh, it's Tijuana. I mean, that's a, you know, that, that's a, a hurdle that a lot it's of got times- got a stigma. 
yeah, people got to overcome it. I get it, but like be open to possibility. Don't just be closed off. What if that, what if you being closed off caused you to die? What if there is a possibility in Tijuana? I mean, what if there is? I mean, that, that, that being closed off might have just ended your life. Mm -hmm. So that is, it goes all the way around, being open-minded to conventional therapy. Like, you know, I ask myself this question a lot for, 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 for cancer. If I got cancer, what would I do with certain cancers? You know, testicular cancer, high cure rate high cure rate with conventional therapy. I'd, I'd be considering, you know, conventional therapy. I'd have other things that I'm doing, but I'd be considering the high dose chemo. Um, leukemia, certain lymphomas, be doing probably a lot of conventional therapy, especially with leukemia. Um, <clears throat> and if, if that didn't work, I'd be going and doing other things as well. Uh, other cancers, stage four level, I mean, I, I would probably be doing what we're doing in Mexico for the most part. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's actually, that's what I would be. If I had stage four cancer, I would... The, there's no way solid tumor cancer that I'd be loaded up with tumor until the very end after everything else fell. That would be like my end backup plan, not the first, because I don't want to waste my immune system loading myself up with a chemo. That's just, you know, that's just for me. But um, so I don't know if that kind of explains the mm -hmm. idea, but being open-minded, even, you know, we have access and a knowledge to alternative and conventional cancer treatments that pretty much nobody else has. I mean, we, like that's what we do. I have 25 plus doctors that work with us. I have some of the top scientists in the world that work for us. You know, we have a lot of different options. And the, my answer is be open to all possibility and be reasonable about everything and, and, and weigh your pros and cons. But don't be closed off to Tijuana just because it's Tijuana. That, 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 could, that could kill some people. Yeah, totally. Ed, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think that's a, uh, I love that comparison that you bring with the, the, mixed martial arts to the cancer, um, proactively speaking, you know, we talk a lot about right now, you know, end stage, stage four stuff for the person who wants to proactively prevent this. And what, what recommendations do you have for prevention, a regimen of prevention? And you meant, you mentioned a few things, but if someone right now is like, listen, my goal is to not come out with any cancer, no matter what, what would you tell them to do to prevent it? Um, well, I guess this is going to be like, this would be a little controversial, uh, but you know, controversial is fine. Yeah. yeah uh, because there's a, there's a lot of people that don't like vaccines, but I think that we see a lot of HPV related cancers. And I think the Gardasil vaccine is, uh, I used to not be a big fan, but seeing people die of those HPV related cancers and looking at the numbers, I think that's going to drop the level a lot. Hmm. Um, so that would be one. I think diet, now it's being proven obesity is a major cause of cancer. You've mm -hmm. got to have a good diet. Um, <clears throat> alcohol abuse. So diet, <laughs> talk about diet for a second because you mentioned intermittent fasting before. What type of things should people look into? Yeah, so, uh, so my, my thought for like the, the, the broad market is just be healthy with your diet. Lots of fruits and vegetables, good protein. Um, not a specific diet, but if you, if you can drink fresh pressed organic juices, um, you know, a lot of people do well being on a vegan diet. A lot of people do well being on a vegetarian diet, but just overall good, healthy diet. There's so many diets out there. And I think we get kind of caught in the weeds sometimes on which one to use and get in debates, but I don't personally think it matters as much as a whole. You know, I just think people should less processed diet. foods, refined sugars type of stuff, yeah, low, low GMOs, uh, lots of organic foods. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where, where I land on that. And you were saying alcohol. Oh yeah. Alcohol is a, is a, is a major contributing factor to cancer. I mean, you know, they've got, they pretty much wiped out smoking. Well, not wiped it out, but reduced uh, the amount of people smoking, which is great. But alcohol is another big one, uh, that, uh, causes cancer. So, I mean, really those, those things, I think will make a bit, big difference. You got smoking out of the way, hopefully soon, completely out of the way. You, uh, if, if people were to realize how important it is to not dr over drink, you know, being on a good diet and then be aware of the, uh, you know, HPV related cancers, I think that that's, that's where I would, um, that's where I would start. Uh, and you know, we, we all have these risk factors. I mean, we all, and it's all living too. If I got cancer, I'd be like, you know what? I can see exactly why I got cancer. I mean, I lived a rough life in my twenties. I probably drank too much at one point. <laughs> I mean, I was fighting, a, man, you know, lots of things. And, you know, I'm not, not attached to it too, by the way. You know, we're just doing, doing what we, the, the best that we can. 
Uh, but, you know, being open-minded to the fact that we might be doing things that increase the risk. I know the risk. People hear this, you're hearing the risk. You get to choose your life and what you want to do. And, uh, you know, so we do have those things, kind of like, like obesity. Like, we know how to have people lose weight. But there's still, what, 38% of people that are obese in the United States? Why is that? They're choosing to do it. Same thing. We know how to drastically reduce uh, the chances of us getting cancer. Uh, it's just up to us to do those things. Yeah. I always ask this. First of all, Ed, thank you. Everyone should check out unitedcancercenters.com. Um, they can also check out, you know, chipsahospital.org. Um, any other places we should point people towards? I have one last question before but uh, any other places on, online we should point people towards? No, I think it's unitedcancercenters.com, chipshospital.org, thebigideapodcast.com. Um, so, Ed, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, two questions. One, what's been a low moment, challenging moment that you had to push through? And then on the flip side, what's been a really proud moment for you? Mm, gosh. What's lower. been... Um, <clears throat> especially challenging time that you had to push through? Yeah. So, I mean, I think when we first opened ships, I mean, you know, uh, we all left our lives to do this. So, I mean, in Nashville, uh, I have a great life. My home, it's called East Ivy Mansion. Um, I was, you know, I sold uh, Nashville mixed martial arts. I had sold my clothing line, just kind of hanging back and, um, uh, left everything, all my friends and family in Nashville to go live in Tijuana. And getting the hospital open for those six, first six months was extremely difficult. We lived in the hospital because we wanted to know everything hmm. uh, about running a hospital, every, like, from cleaning the toilets to properly cleaning the uh, OR room to cleaning the ICU. I mean, we were a full service hospital now with over 200 employees. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, but, but to do that, you know, we felt like we needed to know everything and um you know really the first patients i i've seen some sad things as far as you know patients dying and that really took me you know patients dying alone you know with no no, no family family that might not even want to be with them and so sitting with those patients at the end of their life and you know just trying to in a way express love during the end you know, that was, I get emotional talking about that was, just, it's just so deep. People don't even realize, um, you know, uh, that impact that it can have on you. Like being with somebody dying that doesn't have anybody. And then I think to myself, Oh my God, so I have them in the ICU. Let's say they, you know, they, they're not even paying. Like there's, we're making sure they stay here. They don't have friends or family. They're in the ICU. You know, how do you give them, you know, let them die with some dignity. You know, and that those were some of the hardest times for me uh, coming to terms with the importance of dying uh, with dignity and dying with people around me. If it's a disease at the end, you get a car wreck, it's different. But like, if I'm dying, I don't want to die alone. Um, and so that had a big impact. I mean, it, I think it, that can change you as a human being. Um, I could probably have a whole podcast cast on the learnings of that actually just kind of just thinking about it bringing me back to those that moment those moments um so yeah that's those are the, whenever i hear those stories of people being left by their families or whatever um that's all that it just it, that's those are the hardest ones for for me uh you know because we really love people you know it's like you know it's, oh, it's heartbreaking so yeah that's that yeah. um uh gosh the the best times are when we, when we get clear scans. I mean, which is all a lot. We get these clear scans from patients, and um, you know, someone comes in, and uh, you know, we see this. They come in, in a wheelchair. They leave walking. I mean, seeing that over and over again. Those are big celebratory uh, times, um, and it's re it's really like knowing in those moments that you're giving people more life and more time with their family that is you know that's that's priceless you know, there as well what was a clear scan that maybe sticks out to you with i don't know if it was a special young person or a certain case that 
you thought, wow, I can't believe we actually accomplished this. Sure. Yeah. I would say uh, a lady named Charlotte Trainer. Um, she was actually a friend of the family. So anytime I have family members or friends of the family, it's like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little more personal, obviously. And so um, she didn't do any low dose chemotherapy or anything. She was 72 years old. The doctor had given her um, uh, six months to 12 months to live with high dose chemotherapy at that age, which seems crazy. And um, she came in and uh, we did some cryoablation to her original surgery site uh, with the idea that uh, she still would have tumor antigens there and those antigens would give antigen presentation to the rest of the body. So if there was cancer in other parts of the body, it would uh, theoretically eat it up. Uh, we cryoed her liver as well. She had a meta in her liver. We couldn't get to the uh, spot on her lung or the spots in her lung. And um, about, uh, I guess, two months later, so it's three-week treatment, no chemotherapy at all, uh, lots of immunotherapy, Coley's, uh, VG5000, um, Apatone, uh, and two and a half, three months later, completely clear scan. And it's, uh, it was in October two years ago, so about you know, two years and four months uh, mm. ago. And she's mm. still alive today. Wow. Ed, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing this. Thanks for doing what you do. Everyone check out unitedcancercenters.com. Check out chipsahospital.org. Thanks again. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.